In order to really drill in the concept of phonemes and allophones, we're going to do a few problems. The first problem we're going to look at is in English, and it is the difference between an n and an n. So you probably didn't hear much of a difference between these two sounds, but the n on the left is your standard alveolar n, and the n on the right is a dentalized n. This means that your tongue is closer to your teeth. So let's take a look at a data set here. We have the word knife, new, and fame, and these all have our standard alveolar n. But in the word month, billionth, and panther, that n is fronted more towards the teeth, so it sounds more like a n. And the question is, of course, are these different phonemes or are these allophones of the same phoneme? Well, we don't have any minimal pairs here. So for instance, if I were to even change knife to be pronounced as knife, you don't hear it as a separate word with a completely different meaning. You didn't think that, oh, what was that made up word he just said? No, you still hear that as an N. So in English, when you have an intuitive judgment about it, uh, you can kind of make those connections. Of course, in a real data set, you just have to go with what you see. And we don't see any minimal pairs. So the question is, are these allophones? And we need to check and say, well, what environments is this N with the dental occurring, and what environments is the regular N occurring in? Okay, well, if we look at, say, knife, new, and fame, well, knife, this N occurs at the beginning of a word. So, for instance, if we were to draw a chart of when this occurs, we could say it occurs at the beginning of the word, which we put with a hashtag, meaning word, and then a line to say, oh, it's the N is there. And then an I comes after it. In new, well, N occurs at the beginning of the word, then there's an OO after it. And in fame, N occurs at the end of a word, and there's an A before it. So these are all the different environments that the N occurs in. Now what about the N that is dentalized? Well, if we make a little chart like this again, in the first word, it comes after an U uh and before a TH. In the second word, it comes after a schwa, but before a th. And in the third word, in panther, it comes after an a and before a th. So what's, what's the common denominator in all of these? Well, it's that theta. It's that voiceless dental fricative th. So that's what the common environment is. So we can say that, okay, n and n are part of the same phoneme, so they're allophones of the same phoneme, but this dentalized n occurs before theta. And this makes sense because theta is a dental fricative. So this n is dentalized. It's assimilated in a sort of sense. So because that th is dental, when we pronounce our n, we're preparing for that dental and we're shifting our tongue forward and that's dentalizing the alveolar nasal. So we can think of it as a phoneme n, which occurs in many different places as having two allophones. One is the dental n, which this dental n will occur before theta, and this other n occurs everywhere else. So which one is the main phoneme? Well, of course, this regular n is our main phoneme because it occurs in a more broad environment, and this dentalized n occurs only before theta. So this is what a phoneme allophone chart would look like for that English n. So that's one problem. Now, of course, when it's English, we have intuitions about these things, and it's easy to find minimal pairs because we can go into our brains and we can find a lot more than what's in the data set. But let's say I give you a problem in Tagalog. Well, on the left, I have the English translation, and then in the phonetics, I have how they're pronounced. So, for instance, box is cajon, king is hari, to flow is umagos, property is ari, to fetch would be kaon, and to paint would be fumangos. So I'm looking at the H 
and the glottal stop. So in other words, the glottal fricative and the glottal stop. And I want to ask, are these members of the same phoneme? So are they allophones of the same phoneme or are they separate phonemes? To do this, the first thing I want to do is look for minimal pairs. So I want to look for words where they differ in pronunciation only by one sound. And immediately I see, look, cajon and caon. So these are minimal pairs. So these have the same pronunciation except for one sound, which is the H and the glottal stop. And everything else is the same. But more importantly, they differ in meaning. So cajon is box, but caon is to fetch. So because we have minimal pairs, this means that the glottal fricative and the glottal stop are not allophones of the same phoneme. They are distinct phonemes. In fact, if we want even more evidence, take a look at the king and property, which also differ in just one sound, which is that glottal stop and that glottal fricative. Similarly, in umagos and humangos, in fact, I think I may have accidentally added in that N there, we see that there's only one difference if we remove that N, which may have been a mistake, um, and it's just that sound. Again, they have different meanings, so this is a minimal pair. In fact, even if this N was in there for humangos, then this is what we call a near minimal pair. And if we have lots of evidence of near minimal pairs, then we can make this kind of assumption and say, hey, they're probably distinct phonemes. But regardless, we have two solid pieces of evidence. So what does this look like in our phoneme allophone chart? Well, allophones, huh, and the glottal stop, well, these are just members of different phonemes. So the phonetic huh, or the glottal fricative, will go to the phoneme that is a glottal fricative, and the glottal stop will go to a phoneme that is the glottal stop. And what is the environment? Well, according to the data set, this would just be everywhere. So there's no limitations on where these can occur. In other words, there's no allophones. So we just say, well, okay, look, this one phonetic representation just occurs everywhere. We may encounter future data sets that changes this, but for simplicity, because these are separate phonemes and we don't have any other variations in the data set, we just say, look, there's one allophone in this phoneme and it occurs everywhere. Okay, so using minimal pairs really helped us there. In fact, it made us solve this problem pretty quickly. But let's take a look at this third problem, which is E and K in Mokalese. So this E with the circle under it is what we call a voiceless or devoiced E. So in other words, there's no voice, there's no vibrations when we pronounce E. And this sounds like E. So I have five words here. I have pisan, kisa, poki, pil, and kamukiti. Do we have any minimal pairs here? Do we have two words that differ just by one sound? Um, I look here, I don't see any. Okay, so this, this leads me to think, okay, I don't have any minimal pairs, and this is a phonology question, so I'm probably looking at allophones of the same phoneme. Okay, so a good thing to do is to list out all of the environments. So I have the E, and then I have the voiceless E, which I'll just call the voiceless E so you can clearly hear it when I say it. So this E, the sound E, let's write out all the words and places. So in to strike, pokey, it occurs at the end of the word and right after a k. In water, it occurs between p and ol, and in to move, it occurs at the end of the word after t. What about this voiceless e? Well, in pisan, it occurs between p and s. In kisa, it occurs between k and s. And in kamukiti, it occurs between k and t. So, is there some environment that I can talk about that distinguishes between these two allophones or phonemes? We don't know at this point. In other words, we can say distinguishes between the two phones where there's no overlapping between our environments. 
and it might be a little bit challenging to see at first, but if we take a look systematically. So on the left, I see this k and then the end of the word, but for the voiceless e, I see k and then s at the end. So I'm thinking, okay, it can't be just this k that causes this. So maybe it's the fact that e is at the end of the word here. But then I look at this p and ol, and I think, mm, wait a second, it can't just be the fact that it's the end of the word, because in this environment, we have an ol here, and it can't be the p that's doing it, because for the voiceless e, we also have a p here, and that's not causing anything. So maybe it has something to do with this s. And then I look at all the environments for the voiceless e, and I say, no, wait a second, there's a t here. So this is where your knowledge of phonetics really comes in handy. Because what's common about all the environments? Well, for the voiceless E, it's always between two consonants. But if I say just between two consonants, well, that's not good enough for this P and L here, is it? No, but if I look and I say, what about just between voiceless consonants? And one reason to think this is because, oh, look, this E, this vowel is being devoiced, it's voiceless. So maybe that voicelessness has something to do with the properties of the environment that is causing it to become voiceless. And sure enough, when we take a look, and those are both voiceless, these are both voiceless, these are both voiceless. And for the regular E, is it between two voiceless consonants? Does this regular E ever occur between two voiceless consonants? Well, this is at the end of a word, so no. Ol is voice, so no. End of the word, so no. So I think I found my environment for this. So E and H are allophones of the same phoneme, and this E occurs between two voiceless consonants. So we can represent this phoneme allophone chart just like this. So E becomes H, or voiceless E, between voiceless consonants, so between voiceless C's, all right, for short, and it's realized as regular E elsewhere. So this is how we can think of phonemes and allophones given a data set. This is how we can reason through them. In fact, a lot of times when you take a look at special properties of sounds, there's some sort of assimilation going on, and that's what this was. This was assimilation. So this E is becoming voiceless, and it's becoming voiceless because its neighboring sounds are also voiceless, and that is assimilation, so becoming similar to. And that's a really good motivation for a phonological analysis of a data set. In fact, let's take this one step further. Now that we've done this analysis of Mokalese and this one specific vowel, I can now give you some transcriptions of words, and I can ask you, is this an appropriate Mokalese word? Would someone who speaks Mokalese natively pronounce this or expect this? So we can ask ourselves, is the following transcription expected in Mokalese? The first one is apit. And given the analysis we just did, we would say, no, this isn't good. Why isn't this good? Because this E is between P and T, which are both voiceless sounds. So, no, this is bad. It should be a pit, where this e is voiceless. Okay, what about uptiko? Oh, sorry, uptiko. Okay, again, this is not good, and this is not good because although this e is voiceless, which is good because it's between two voiceless sounds, this second e is not, and it should be. So, if this were to be a Mokalese word, we would expect it, oops, I spelled it incorrectly. We would expect it to be pronounced uptiko. So, just because you do a phonology data set, typically we can generalize it to other words. Now, of course, this may not always be true. Sometimes we take a data set and we simplify it just so we have something to absolutely analyze and make sure we have a solution. But generally, we can extend that to more words in the language and we can make predictions. So the key word is expected. Is it expected? Based on the data, these two transcriptions would not be expected because it does not follow or adhere to the rules and generalizations that we have made. 
So hopefully these three problems have given you a little bit more insight into phonemes and allophones. I know it's really hard to see with just a couple examples in one video, so I hope giving you a few more examples and walking through these problems step by step, that you can begin to tackle your own problems without worrying too much or wondering, how do I start? If you have any more questions about this, please leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them.